Good morning, everybody. Y'all want to get to your feet with us? We're going to start the service off with some prayer. You guys want to bow your heads and close your eyes. Thank you, Lord, for another day in your house, Lord. I do ask that you would bless this service today, Lord. I thank you that we get to spend some time with you today, Lord. I ask that you would open our hearts and help us to focus on you. I ask that you would allow us to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. The verse I want to share with you guys this morning is Psalms 40, verse 5. It says, Many, Lord my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. None can compare with you. Were I to speak and tell of your deeds, there would be too many to declare. How many of you have blessings from God this morning? Amen. I think one blessing is that we're all alive today. Amen. We're all breathing. We have breath in our lungs. Can you imagine if we were to take the time to praise God and to thank Him for every single little thing that He's done for us, down to the smallest, tiniest detail? It would take an eternity, amen? amen? So today, let's just start with the first little tiny detail. Let's just thank Him for life this morning. Let's just praise Him for His glory. Focus on Him, leave whatever's going on outside of this building there. And today, just focus your hearts on Him, amen?
we thank you for your love that you poured out on the cross for us. Lord. We thank you for the mercy that you've given us so that we can never deserve, God. And we just ask so that you would remind us of this yes. this morning.
feel alone, God, I pray over those situations that they would fill those needs, Lord, that those people would feel your love, Lord, and feel your presence, God. I pray, Lord, that you would open doors for them and help them to see those open doors, that they would bless those people and just fill those needs that they have and remind them of who you are, Jesus.
and I hear you say with me, nobody, nobody. is perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Now turn to the person next to you and tell them, you're not perfect, no man. <laughs> because as far as mindset of the idea we have, because if you go to life, this is a mindset, people. It goes over and over and over again. Uh, for some reason, young people think they know more than that mom. Even though that mom had them at least by 19 years. So they feel like, they got it. Doesn't that mom understand that times have changed and things are different? A lot of things have changed. You've changed. Your mindset has changed a lot of things. But the one thing that doesn't change is the relationship that God has with man. And the rules that God established for the family are still the rules. We don't go by our rules, we go by His rules. And being that our journey through life is to choose our eternity, you're here today, and every moment that you live, you're choosing your eternity. I told you countless times, God does not determine your eternity. You will determine it. That's the reason why it's so uh, important. You have the right mindset as we make decisions in life. To understand that God is perfect. He has a perfect plan for your life. When you got, follow God's plan, you're going to be blessed. You're going to be prospered. Now, how many want a blessing for your family? I think that's what we all want to promise to be blessed. Well, there's a method, a way to do things, a way to understand things. We've been dealing with 2 Chronicles 7, 15, where God speaks to his family. See, he says, if my people who are called by my name, he's relating to the Israelites as his spiritual family. Now, we are spiritual family, I understand that. And spiritual family begins at home, that's where it starts. I've said countless times, what you have at home is what we have in church. The only difference is we change clothes and we change attitudes and we walk through the door. But the fact that a lot of homes have issues, things that have to be mended, things we have to communicate with, things we have to fix, does not change the fact that they just utterly go away. We need to make time, have communication to understand. If we follow the same format that God gave to the Israel nation of the spiritual family, where he says, this is what you've got to do in order for me to bless you. He said, man, you're in defiance. You're in disobedience. You're paying a lot of havoc for your life. But these are the rules you need to follow. If you do that, then I'm going to bless you. And he says, first thing you do, you need to humble yourself. I told you humbleness is an attitude. It's a mindset. A way to be able to be molded, to be taught. A person that is humble is a good listener and evaluate things. And if he's humble, he needs to make the choices that are right for their lives in order to go forward. Humbleness prepares you to make changes. Humbleness prepares you to admit when you're wrong in certain issues of life. And that's why it's important. God said, for me to do anything with you, you need to be humble. I can't deal with people that have attitudes. I have given you free will to make choices for your own life. You choose your own destiny. I will not do that for you. I will help you and encourage you and lead you and prosper you when you do it my way. But when you do it your way, it's a highway. You're on your own. You answer for your own decisions. You pay the consequences of bad choices in life. But when you're humble, you learn to respect. You learn to have um, communication. You need to obey. You know how to submit to authority. And I think a lot of times one of the most difficult things is to submit to authority. We like to be in charge. We like to run the show. Well, young people, your day will come, and it's not today. Your moment will come when you get to be daddy and mama, and you run the show. You have, you young kids that are not married or have kids, you have no idea what I talk about when I talk about being a parent. You have no idea the love and the commitment made by your friends, even though you think something different because they're not doing what you want them to do. They're not giving you what you think you should deserve. They're not giving you what, giving you the, the opportunity to do, do whatever you want to with your life. You think they're messing with you. You think they're in your way. And actually, the greatest blessing you'll ever have is the person you call that mom. There's nobody can love you more than that. Understand that. Well, we're all different in our way we express our loves. We find that a lot of times mamas are huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy kind of person. And that's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of times, most of the dads are kind of like stern and macho and all this kind of stuff. And those two sides get together. That kind of mindset, that kind of attitude. 
But there's some of us that we're huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy. I mean, here I am, uh, very late in my life, and my kids are in their mm -hmm years now of life. They're not as blessed in years as I am, but still, wherever I see them, wherever we get together, and where it's still, I don't care if anyone. We go to a football game, huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy, it's good to see. You. Have a good day. An expression of love. And so many households, there is no love. And so many households, that's gone down the drain. And I know there comes a time of mind, so we're kids see. And really? Really? Remember when you were growing up and if your dad and mom would take you to school in the morning? At the very beginning, when you were in grade school, it was huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy. And mom would sit there in the car, sit there in the car, and you're walking in, they're going like, <laughs> and the kids are like, I forgot the lunch. Went back to the lunch. <laughs> Remember those days? Time went on, and we feel huggy, huggy, kissy, kissy. Then we got to junior high. We got to junior high, and it was uh, mom. Yeah. Can you drop me off a block away from the school? <laughs> At the school, mom. Drop me off a block away from the school. That's better that way. A lot of things change, but the thing we cannot release or the thing we can't let go of is the respect and love we should have for, for the parents that God gave to us. I know you didn't get to choose your parents. But look, on the other side, they didn't get to choose you either. The family is instituted by God. And what God places you in a place to, that you call family, that's where you owe the greatest respect and the greatest love until the very end. You can't quit on love. You can't quit on the people that most love you. You can't turn your back on them and expect to be blessed. Because the first commandment with God's blessing is honor your father and your mother and you'll have a long life and you'll be blessed. Now we're talking to Sister Ida, we're talking this week, when she was talking about how she felt about her life. Every time she compared this, she was like, right. I'm not there, like really difficult. She would say, God, I've honored your word. I've honored my dad and my mom, so I'm going to have a long life. I'm going to live a long time. So Joe, be a good help. She's going to live a long life. <laughs> and she did a great job with her dad and mom. As far as I'm it. So see, we have a responsibility, not because, not the Bible, not only because the Bible has because in the heart we feel that way. You never know how much you love them or how much you need them until you don't have them anymore. If you have your dad and mom, enjoy them. They will not be here forever. Or you have controversies. You have difference of opinions. That's part of growing up. But that's what God steps in. The great I am. To give the solution to the problem and make you understand. As we reach out for help so many times, we reach out to so many avenues. And when we're needing counsel, we need to speak to somebody. It's ironic we go out to seek people that will tell us what we want to hear and not to tell us the truth. The Bible says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will. So as you go through issues of life, careful who you choose to counsel. Careful who you listen to to give directions for your life. Be wise about your choices in life. Because one bad choice could cost you your life. It could cost you everything you ever dreamed of to go down the drain. Because you weren't smart enough to go where, Pastor, to go to the one that knows it all, and that's God. I know it's easier to speak to people that you can see. It's easier to speak to a friend. It's easier to speak to the parents of a friend that you have confidence in. But the right thing is to speak to God because he knows it all. When we go through issues of life, there's always two sides of the story. My side, your side, and the truth. Three sides. And the only one knows all three sides is God. He only knows all three sides. And the only to bring justice to your issues of life is going to be God. But I know a lot of people say, well, you know, I'm not religious enough. Well, then get religious. Find peace of God. Find direction and peace of mind. And come to understand that as in this world, being humble 
will prepare you for the greatest dreams of life. Being humble makes you receptive to receive advice, to go forward and not to give up on your dream. Then he said, if you just ask forgiveness of God, you turn from your evil ways, the things in your life that are your secret, that you might be doing that are not agreeable to God's walk, the walk of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you ask for forgiveness, and restore your faith in God, then God will bless your life. And we said last Sunday when we spoke about this, that the only one that knows about your secret life is you and God and nobody else. The bottom line is this. The only one that can forgive sins is Jesus Christ anyway. So you might as well take it to the source that can make a difference in your life. To be smart enough, to have the courage enough to stand before God and see who you are. Not in the light of who you want to be, but in the light of who he wants you to be. And that's what you begin before him if you have fellowship with God. And have the courage and feel with the confidence that in spite of how bad you've been in life, you can say, God, I'm sorry, and he's going to forgive you. The most difficult thing in life is to admit that we're wrong. And to a lot of people, the most difficult thing, the most difficult phrase in their life is to say, I'm sorry. But a lot of times, humble pride will make you a better person. To be able to admit that you're wrong will make you a better person. It makes you human. It brings you down to earth. It makes you understand, I still not a girl enough to do in my life. There's things that have to be molded, needs to be changed. And the only can mold my life, my spiritual walk with God, my relationship with God, is you and God. Their dad mom can influence by bringing you to church, and we will go to church. Oh, we're going to go to church. They can influence you, but they can't change you. You have to make a choice of your own. If I can go, go again to the concept, you choose your own eternity. As you go through life, never believe that because you're young, that because you're just starting life, you're going to live forever. Ask me, I've been at funerals, kids, teenagers, young people. I had the opportunity to help a family. I did do so to help a family that uh, at the age of about 29, the lady had a brain hemorrhage and she passed away at 29. Who was to think? And on my said 29, he just barely began in life. And her life was over. It's done with. So what makes you think you're going to live forever? What makes you believe you're going to live forever? Yet by faith, we have dreams and goals we want to meet in life. And it's wrong, not wrong to have dreams and goals in life. It's awesome. It's how we find that's what motivates us to keep on going forward. But understand, everything is subject to the will of God and your position with God to ask for forgiveness when you're wrong. Then the scripture says, when you have done these things, and then the word comes in. Second Chronicles 7, 14. He says the following words. Then, and stop right there. He says, when you met the conditions, I've set down conditions to be blessed, then, the word then puts into motion the solution to the problem. There we stop for a moment. That's not for the solution. There's an open door here now. I've met the conditions to be blessed. What's next in my life? Is to be obedient to God. Because the most difficult thing in life is to be obedient. How many people in this room, in this church right now, and watch our video, have been disobedient, raised both hands? Uh, let's go again. Let me give a survey. Let me see what hands don't go up. How many have been disobedient before? Wow, well, I got some perfect ones in here. The most natural thing is to be disobedient. The first thing they tell you, don't do this. And that's all that's saying, try it. Try it. You can get away with it. Check it out. When you first get your car, or your truck, and you're driving, and dad or mom is within the car, you abide by the law. Once they get off, and your friends get on, 
Now he can tell you what's next. Oh, come on, let's see how fast this thing runs. <laughs> That's nature. Many years back, I bought the first Monte Carlo when they changed over. They didn't have one in El Paso. I bought it in George, Georgetown, Texas. And by the way, they're like, oh my God, super sport. They could see me because the car was white. They could see me. I read nice people will honk and say, look down the window, what car is that? Monte Carlo. And it said the speedometer said that it went 120 miles an hour. That's what the speedometer said. I accepted it by faith. I loaned my car to my boys, and they tell me, they didn't do it by faith. The car does run 120 miles an hour. <laughs> See, to be obedient is a blessing of God. Sin came to the work through world through disobedience. And we stop and think about sin. Everything that has to do with sin has to do with disobedience. Breaking the law of God. Since the dead comes into play because you've asked for forgiveness. You have a new start in Jesus Christ. Now the thing is ahead of you. Now it's time to go. Here comes the solution. Let me tell you something. For every issue in life, you want an answer? God has the answer. The word of the source will bless your life. And then you would ask, Pastor, how can God bless my family? How many want God to bless for your family? Let me take you to the book of 2 Kings, chapter number 5. I'm going to give you one scripture as a whole chapter. It's a story of a family that faces adversity. I want you to understand that just because you're good doesn't exempt you from the issues of life. Just because you find favor, because you're kind, because you help people, because you do your part, doesn't mean you're not going to go through trying times. That's part of the course. And in chapter 5 of 2 Kings, we find the story of Naaman. Naaman is in the military of the Syrian army. He's got favor with the boss, with the king. He's got favor with people. People love him. He's done a lot to help people out, but he has one problem. This family gets hit with a death sentence. In spite of all he's done to help people out, to advance his venue, his popular with people, he has a death sentence because a man has leprosy. He had contacted leprosy. It was a sickness that had no cure. It was a death sentence. Once you were a leper, you're done. There's no answer. You're going to die. And see, the family has to confront it. In spite of all the good things you have done, he runs into this situation. I'm a leper. There's nothing I can do to change that. The mindset of people at that time said, there is no answer. Naaman, you're going to die. But see, understand something. And the greatest issues of life, the greatest problems you'll ever face in life, there is an answer because God always has a final word. We need to understand that we face certain issues of life. Sometimes we feel like there is no answer. I don't know what you're going through today. What you personally are going, your family is going through today. I have no idea. But to some of you, it's a death sentence. It's a mindset that there is no answer, Pastor. There is no solution. I run into a brick wall. I can't do this. Well, the Bible says, Paul speaking, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who stands. Yeah. The ability for the man and woman, the young person to go to God and understand God does have the final word. But when you run into issues like this, I feel there is no hope. God will surround you with people to give you hope. If you're a good listener and you follow instructions, you're going to be blessed. But if you accept the death sentence and say there's no hope, you're going to die. You're going to give up, you're going to quit. And in your life today, I have no idea what you're going to, but don't give up. God's in control of all things. Don't say, what's the use? It's useless. Pastor, has been going on for years. This issue the has been going on for a long time. I don't see a solution coming. If you have God, there's an answer. Because family is an institution of God. He ordained family. He ordained the principles. He gave all the answers to your need. You just can't give up faith just because I have leprosy in the family. It's all said and done. It's time to do something about it. 
Was he going to always put somebody in your path? The person you would least expect and hope you is going to be here. God going to send the person you you least thought of would be an answer to your problem. He's going to send somebody. Get ready. Somebody's going to cross road with you. Somebody's going to come in your direction to give you an answer. And it's your job to listen and to obey. Well, in his case, it's a young lady. She's a slave. She had, they had raided Syria. They had gone into Israel. They had raided. They had taken people out and brought slaves over to Syria. And in his household, in Naaman's household, there was a young lady that was from Israel, and she was a slave. Now let's stop and think about this young lady. See, what I want you to understand is this. If you look at your Bible, it doesn't give a name. Because people are going to help you don't need recognition. They just need to be the heart of God. They just have to have the heart of God and the desire to help you. It's not important who they are, where they came from. It's not important. It's important that we listen to what they have to say. This young lady has been brought out of her household. She has to leave her house. She's taken to Syria to be a slave, to work, taken away from her traditions, from everything she ever lived for, is taken away. She could have said, huh, let him die. Good, good. They take me prisoner, they take me a slave, I got to work for them, let him die. But this young lady had the fear of God in her heart. And it's very simple. See, God's plans are very simple. They're not complicated. They're down to earth. Easy to understand. It doesn't go on for hours. It's just one phrase. She tells Naaman's wife, Ma'am, if your husband would go to the prophet in Samaria, he would heal him. That's what she said. She opened the door. The person that God used to open the door was a slave that had no rights. No one else would have listened to, but there's a need. It comes from a simple slave person. Those people go across her path. They do never think had worked for them. People that will bless your life because God sent them your way. When God sends somebody to you, it's not a coincidence. God's in control. You need to listen. You need to obey. You're the one where they need. They're not. You're just opening the door that then a second chronicles comes into play. There's a solution. It's coming. It's coming. We got to grab it. He ought to go to the prophet in Samaria and he didn't get healed. Now understand this. You can go a lot of people, but there's only the right people that will lead you where you need to be. You need to be smart enough to be able to understand who's in there to help you. Who's there really to give you the advice that you need. She can give the solution. She can give you advice that you just need to go there. It's a process. You just have to follow. Process of obedience. So he gets all excited. The wife says, hey, pay this up. The girl here says, this is going to go to proper Samaria. Oh, I got this. I got this. So he goes to the king of Syria and he tells me, hey, the young lady at my house said, if I go to the prophet in, in, um, in Samaria, I'm going to be healed. So he takes what man thinks is a way to solve the problem. The king said, I'm going to give you letters to take to the king of Israel. Give him the letter, tell him what the intent is. I'm going to give you some money and some gifts. See, he was going to buy his miracle. And you don't buy God's miracles. It's not about what you can produce. It's what God is going to produce. All he needs from you is obedience. He doesn't need all these other things. You can bring all the reasons why. And a lot of times when you go through problems and issues, you say, God, I've been faithful, I've been this, I've been you talking about all the good things you've done. And it holds no merit. It's not about what you've done, it's about who you are. And how obedient you are to do what he's asking you to do. So when he says, I bring all these things, I got this. I got the answer. So when he takes off to go see the king of Israel, he's got it, he got, I got this, man, I got this. So when he goes and delivers the letters to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel sees where he's going, he just tears his clothes off. In, in, in act of submission, of surrender, he's saying all of the Syrian king is trying to do is create problems to create a war and come take it all prisoners. 
he missed the point for it. This is where he's saying, oh, I don't know what to do with this. See, because it wasn't the king of Israel that had the answer. It was the Lord of Israel that had the answer. He had gone to the wrong person. Here comes the next one. The prophet Elisha. When he sees what the king has done, he tells the king, how did you do that? He says, because this and this, a letter to Moses comes up if you're trying to create havoc to get a war and be taken as prisoners. And Elisha tells him, tell him in my house, I got the answer. So, the king says, let me send you to somebody else. He says, I want you to go to Elisha's house of talk. He tells him how you get there. He gets his entourage and takes all his stuff with him. He goes to Elisha. He gets to Elisha's house. Hey, I'm looking for Elijah. Elijah sends a messenger. Elijah didn't even come out. Elijah sent a messenger to tell him what the solution was. Now, get it again. Is the name of the person that Elijah sent out in the Bible? No, it's not. His name is not there. See, that's where you're not coming to play. We can be that one person that makes a difference in the lives of people. We don't have to be recognized. We don't have to be glorified. We don't have to win a lot of popular contests. We just have to be obedient to God. All we are in that miracle is a gopher. How many understand the word gopher? How many do not understand gopher? Okay, I see somebody like a gopher. And said, I went to a gopher. No, I said gopher. A gopher is you go for this and you go for that and go for that. That's a gopher. Elijah sends him a gopher, one of his servants, and tells him, the man of God says, for you to go to the Jordan River and dip yourself some of the time, you're going to be healed. Woo! Close the door and walks off. Naaman, the Bible says, got mad. First of all, because Elijah didn't even have the courtesy to come talk to him. He thought, for sure, he was going to come talk to him. He sends a servant. And then he sends me to go wash myself in the Jordan River, did myself seven times, and I received my healing. What is wrong with that? Is he crazy? I have leprosy. Now, leprosy is a removal of flesh, open wounds. The Jordan River is the dirtiest river that there is. And he wants me to go there and did myself seven times? Imagine all the stuff that he get into my wounds and stuff. He's crazy. He's dumb. I won't say the rest of it. <laughs> it's not right. You know what he's talking about? The Bible says he got angry. Why did he got ang get angry? Because God's solution sometimes doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Didn't I say there's rivers in our area that are clean? I can go there and do it there, but why right there? Because God said there. That's where you go. That's where you're going to find the, the, your problem you're being met. And see what I find is this. A lot of times people go out trying to find answers, but they've already made up their mind to what they want to hear. And they'll keep asking until they hear what they want to hear. Well, do you want help? Do you want the truth? Or do you want to convince yourself that you're right at all costs? What is it you want? In order to be able to receive, you have to do what God says. And sometimes what God says is going to hurt because you're wrong. See, there's people trying to find answers and truth according to what they want, not to what's right for their life. Your mindset is already said about what you want and why that's. You're wasting people's time. You're wasting your own time. Go ahead and suffer. Pay the consequences. That's what you want. You think you got it all together? Yet, here's God's message to this man. This is what you have to do in order to get it done. So, he said, no. No way. It's not going to happen. Then here comes a next set of person. I told you, people, God will surround you with people. The ser his servants now, again, no names. His servants now, Here's a servant speaking to the boss. Hey, they said, 
If he would ask you to do something else, would you have done it? Well, yeah, but he asked me to do that. Well, then why not do it? I think that's where they got the commercial try it. You like it. What do you have to lose? Come on, boss, let's go. You know that goes people in the car. Come on, let's go. Come on, we'll go with you. Come on, we'll be there. You know. And he said, how many times? Seven times. Do you have any idea why seven times? Do you have any idea why it had to be seven times? Seven is the number of perfection. That's why it was going to be seven times. Who was sending down the message? God. We're going to do my way. Now, it's okay, let's go. Get in there. Like, oh, I'm lost, let's go. He gets in there. And he goes down one time to the other. Yeah, he's still got it, man. Two, three, that, that. Four, five, half, half. Come on, you're almost there. This is the sixth time. Comes up, he still has literacy. See, guys? Boss, you miscounted. It's only six. He said seven. Come on, folks. Come on, you're within one. And how many of you are so close to your victory and you've given up? Your answer is right there and you quit. You give up. Like that's what to use. You're that close to victory, people. You need to follow the plan. You need to finish the plan, God, is until for your household, for your family, for your love, for your communication, for the bond that needs to be done to mend the broken fence there is within your household and with your own life. Come on, boss. One last time. Come on. Let's go. Come on. Come on, Andrew. Come on. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. He goes down. When he comes up, he's clean. He's been healed through obedience. Obedience is the answer to every issue of life. I think we need to be smart enough to understand that everything in our household has a solution if we're obedient. If we can have communication, if we can talk and be reasonable and not take the mind to an attitude because I'm the dad and the mom, only what I say counts. Be good listeners. Be good listeners to what they have to say. But then kids, you be good listeners to what they have to say. But a lot of times it makes a lot of sense because they live longer. They can see what happens. They can come down. I would recommend to all the families, make men's. Fix whatever has to be fixed before it's too late. I think the saddest thing I've ever seen and I've seen this happen several times in my ministry as a pastor, as I'm at a funeral of a dad or a mom. I have kids come up and say, Dad, I'm so sorry. To me, you can't hear you. It doesn't matter anymore. Mama, Mama, you were right. Mom, you were right. Too late, she's gone. And how many sleepless nights did they go through? Because you wanted to do it your way. Because you thought your way was better than their way. Because you thought they were old fashioned and they were just trying to run your life. No, they're trying to get you blessed. They want the best for your life. They want you to understand that any counsel they have is because they can see things that you can't see. And you won't understand. In your memory, I have a life with your chart. August the 27th, 2023. Chart this message. What I told you today. And 10 years down the road for some of you, they're a little bit older. You get married and you have your kids. You're going to say, Pastor was right. Because you have no idea how much you love until you have it all. It's difficult. A lot of times there are battle issues in a family because there's no communication. There's no open door. Everybody shuts the door. Everybody gets angry because everybody has the answer. And the institution is of God. And unless the Lord builds a house, those who labor labor in vain. And I told you, God 
God's blessing for your family begins at home. To be able to have an open line of communication, to be able to speak, to ask for guidance, to pray, and to seek God's will for your life. God will answer. God will bless. When you can say, the doctor said, as far as I'm concerned, me and my house, we're going to show the Lord. I need that to moms, and I got my decision. To be able to say, as far as we're concerned, we're going to serve the Lord. Under the roof of this house, we will serve the Lord. I will instill to you the values of God, the principles of faith, that when you leave this house, you might be blessed. Dad, Mom, you won't know how good of a job you did until the kids leave, get married, and have their own families. Then you know how good of a job you did. But let it be said, if for somewhere along the line the kid doesn't make it and their faith walk, if you did your part, don't blame yourself. Because you can lead a horse to a water, but you can't make him drink. So today, I would ask, is there any many offenses that have to happen? Let it happen. And see, a lot of times, it's not only between parents and kids. Sometimes it's within the kids themselves. Brothers and sisters. Being dead, mom, and you just can't get along. They have their mindset. And I think that the worst thing a kid could ever do is to go in that concept and idea that my dad and mom might have their favorite ones. It's sad to say that in some households, that's true. It's very obvious in some households. You can see it. There's always a favorite one. Why? Because Pobrecito Mijo, he's the youngest, he's the youth, he's the least athletic of the bunch. At least he has to ask his foot, nothing else. We got a king or two. Let's be fair across the board. Let's love all our kids. I've been asked many times by people, Pastor. Do you have your favorites? No. No. I've been there for all my kids. Always. Because they're my life. No one is more special than the other. This one over here, I go to football games. I go to baseball games. I go because he's got boys. This one's got girls. <laughs> it's all different. But all of our little love for my life. And I think they all know that. And they'll drop it and have favorites. And there's nothing I would do as a grandpa, of course. But it goes back to the original. It starts at home. It doesn't start with grandpa or grandma. It starts at home with your family. Could we be open enough? Could you accept a suggestion to men broken fences before it's too late? The longer you wait, the more difficult it's going to be. Problems do not solve themselves. To walk away doesn't make it right. It only makes it worse. And they will know the truth, and the truth will set them free. And I think this is the greatest lesson we'll ever get. Your blessing for your family begins at home. Or you can communicate, you can talk, you can argue, why not? That's part of the course. Nobody has a house where nobody argues, oh my God. Well, we said that the only couple that makes a life was dead when it was new. And they took my way to do it. That's the way we're made. But it doesn't justify the fact that God didn't give his common sense to men the broken heart. We have 
Abiviesa with us on the fish. And we find out Abiviesa, a lot of hurting kids will talk to their teachers about issues parents didn't even think were happening. But seeing kids see things from a different perspective. And only he can be smart enough and the wisdom of God to touch and mend the broken heart. Dad, mom, he opened his suggestions. Now the broken heart is sin. How can I tell that sounds? I think the one thing that I would advise you as a dad, and I can speak as a dad, is when you sit to discipline your child, listen to what they have to say. Don't interrupt, let them talk. I don't care how dumb they hear. They like, just listen. I'm not going to kill you to listen. Bite your tongue. Think whatever you want, but don't say it. Then when it's your turn, the deal is this. Now it's my turn. Let me tell you why not. This is people that will listen will have a solution. People who will fight will never be at peace. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin. Take a step. Be strong, be committed, and say from this day forward, be in my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Because this morning we're going to do with you just about every last of the month. Want you to bring your family up here? Take a moment to reconcile. If we need to reconcile, take a moment to pray again. If part of the family needs prayer, all of you together pray for that part of the family. Be a family. Fight the battle for them. Build a build a, a protection around your family. Let them be blessed because today you took the initiative. If it all begins at home, it begins at my house. And me in the house. We're going to support. You want to do this for the Lord? If your family's not here, you come anyway. And you send word. You send word of God to them wherever they might be. Send word of comfort and strength in their trying time. And let them know that they're loved. Let them know that through God's love, all things are possible. All mistakes can be forgiven. All the things that have brought havoc, have brought distrust. You can fix it. It all has fixed. It all has fixed. It all can be fixed. If you just fix it. Let the guard down. And what do we say? Raise hands of surrender to God. Just raise hands of surrender to God. It's not time to fight. It's time to form a bond that will hope. Talk to one another. Talk to one another. And you sit there with and talk to one another. And let's mend the broken places. Let's make it right. Obedience destroys defiance. Obedience will produce the then that brings a solution. And everything in life has a solution. Everything. Everything in life has a solution. You just have to be. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to open up your heart. And if you're hurting, follow. Oh. from us, to deceive us from 
Oh God, we can bring blessing to our, to our lives. Break Heavenly Father that bondage. Open up the communication as we speak as a family. Give the wisdom to build and not to destroy. Help us to bring a healing and not be part of the devastation. Teach us to be calm. Teach us to wait upon you. For those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. We pray for guidance. We pray for your love. We pray for your understanding. Feed us. so proud to say no. Let us be humble enough to accept the change that is necessary to bring a blessing. For when my house is blessed, when my home is blessed, then your kingdom is blessed on these waters. We place our lives at your hands. Mold us to your life. God's condition and God's blessing. Underline that. Because next Sunday we're going to talk about then. How it comes into play. Once the conditions are been met, then the answer comes. No blessing. Well, we need an usher this morning. Oh, we can do everything this morning. Do we need to tell you not to just raise your hand and Robert will come and do the tiny novel will help you. Help us make the commitments. We made a lot of focus and emphasis on how many used to worship under the stars and it's hurt. It's hurt the finances of the church. But a lot of money has gone there and not what we need to, to go to pay our bills. So it's just busy. Month of August is done, people. It's over. So next time we get together, September, ready to go. And then comes October, and then that 28th of October gets here, and we get that done, and behind us, and we move on. All right? So, more reminding about this, and really good. This Wednesday is departments. Robert and Pat want all the couples to come before. They get a class ready for you. You need to show up. You need to show up. One hour. 
women's ministry and waiting for the ladies to come in our class. And we all prepare our classes in order to be able to function together and make your home a better home. <laughs> you can make those packages on Wednesday night from 7 to 8 o'clock. And don't forget that on Monday night, if you have someone who needs prayer, give us a name and phone number and we'll call you. <coughs> it turned out to be really, really nice because you give me a number right here, we dial the number, and we'll put the person on speaker, and everybody can all pray for their need. So if you have someone that you need prayer on, at the entrance there's a little slip of paper, you put the name and the phone number, and on Monday night we will call you. And we'll pray over their needs, okay? We don't have to know them. So you write who can give the information so I can blame you for the call. They told me that you're not living right, so come out of sin, Mama. But we will be able to do that in my goodness. The next Sunday we start, the month of September. Uh, don't forget to stop by your kids. They'll shop over here. They're still doing their thing, helping to raise the money. And they in order for us to have this worship on this stars. Everybody's working hard at what we do. God is good. God is good faithful. And uh, it's just right that as we go our separate ways today, that God would have given you a really blessed week. I love to see many of you here on Wednesday night. You really, really would be good. So do your part in God in the middle. Would you stand with me with your prayer? And our prayer didn't include uh, Brother Cruz. He called me up. The also called me. I did sort of pay for the for it to come to the phone because you let me know that Brother George has COVID. And uh, we are not very grateful for the Lord, but the problem is this, that it's about her situation, that, that she might catch COVID. It's one of her situation is right. But Brother George just sent friends to Casa, because she had a lot of mercy and people to minister. We're working, Lord's working with us on her situation. Things are getting better, God's in control. We pray for this and we pray for the Lord. Heavenly Father, to be able to rest your kingdom, that's our responsibility. We've been blessed given the Lord income that we might bless the kingdom of God. We bring our tithes and all things in obedience to you, Lord. Bible says, you will bless the triple giver is with joy that we invest. We ask in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Now we pray for Brother George and Sister Elsa, and for Sessia for many others that have needs within the family of God. God, extend your hand of love and mercy, Lord, a protective hand, a healing hand over the ones that need to be healed. For we ask in the personal name of Jesus Christ. Amen.